be uh, reading or studying uh, one one chapter in the book of Acts. I uh, I must admit that uh, while I was gone, I've been speaking a lot about talking about leadership in the church. Actually, uh, for three Sundays in a row, I uh, was speaking in 1 Timothy 3, 1 Peter 5, and Hebrews 13. They were all about church leadership. And it was because I was there because I uh, I helped a church celebrate their 24th anniversary and also at the same time okay the pastor and I ended up helping another young pastor, young man from Timicula, used to be our member, uh, our people before. So, uh, I might as well, hey, I'm in a role, I might as well uh, talk about uh, church leadership, right? right? Maybe we need it. Maybe we have to examine ourselves and really assess ourselves where we are in, uh, in our work with, with God. So, uh, I'm using a, a, a King James version of, of the, the Bible, but uh, for some reason I printed out an NIV uh, for me to read and for you to follow, actually. Uh, I'm going to read just the first five verses. In Acts 20, it will be in chapter 20, verses 17 to 38. We will uh, read it, and I want you to, would you please stand up and please read the Bible, the first five verses, verse 17 to 28. From, from, it's only from 17 to uh, actually uh, 21 that we are going to read, okay? Alright. From my leaders, Paul sent to Ephesus, the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I live the whole time I was with you? From the first day I came from the province of Asia. by the parts of the Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you but talk to you publicly from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that there is still God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Please remain standing. May the Lord have blessings to the reading of his word. Father, as we come to you, we pray God that as we again study your word, bless us and be with us that we will be able to understand what is coming from your word. As we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You will have sit down, please. To give you a little background on, uh, on chapter 20, actually Paul was on his way to uh, Jerusalem. He had some collection that he has to deliver and also he was in a hurry 
not to miss the one of the Jewish festival, the feast of the Pentecost. He didn't want to miss that. So on his way, he stopped on a land, in an island, or a, a shore nearby episode. They call us, as we heard it, Miletus. This little shore is actually around maybe uh, 25 to 30 miles south of Ephesus. And uh, it, will, it will probably take him like a couple of days to summon the elders and be back. So what he did was he sent somebody to get the elders, just the elders of the church. He wanted to, of course, see the Ephesians church, but it will take him time. Not that he wasn't, that he wouldn't want to see the visions, but he was in a hurry. He had to uh, be in Jerusalem, and uh, from Jerusalem, he was planning to go to Spain. Uh, that was his plan. So, as we are going to start, uh, I just want to let you know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he says that, Follow my example as I follow the examples of Christ. Paul was in the business of leading people by example. He was, he was magnificent in, in approaching people and telling him, uh, follow me. And I, you know, and, and that's, that was he was. He likes to disciple. So, from this outline, we are going to learn at least four things. The first thing that he is going to tell us is, that will be from verses 17 to 21. He is a humble and faithful servant. What does it take to, to be a humble servant? Let's look at it in verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day, that I come into Asia after what manner I have been with you in all season. And, and that tells us that he actually was going to stay with them. And in verse 19, he said that serving the Lord in all humility in mind, and with many tears and trials, which befell me by the lion in the wake of the Jews. First thing, serving God, that was Paul's priority. And it should be ours. It doesn't matter if we are elders, if we are pastors, Bishop, to serve God is the priority. And that was his job. How did he do it? He lived among them. He didn't have to live in a monastery and come down on Sundays. He was there. He can fellowship with them. He teaches them. He fellowship almost every day because it says all systems. You know, I always, always, 
ask some leaders, you know, that we should, we should spend more time with the flags. Not just, of course, some of us has a job, and I don't, I'm a retired. <laughs> you guys do, so <laughs> not to work. I'm sorry for you guys. <laughs> See, that's the good thing of retired people. They have all the time. They have the time to serve God. It's not that I'm trying to hurry up you guys to retire. No, no, no. But that's how you are to be with people. You have to be with them. Not just on Sundays. And that's how Paul, I remember he was even working with them as a pen maker. So even the work ethics was there. He did not hide from them. He was transparent to them. That was serving God. Another thing that we can see in these verses that follows is serving with all humility in mind. That is important. You know, a leader that is not humble, a leader that is proud, he cannot hear God. Why is that? He listens to himself. He doesn't care. A humble servant is the one who listens in humility, in the mind, with God. The night before I was to uh, ordain uh, this young uh, just graduated from the seminary. I asked him, we were in Starbucks. I asked him, why, why are you here? Why are you doing this? There was silence. You know, I, I was afraid what he was going to answer me. Actually, you know. You have to care for the lost. 
That's what it is. The people that haven't seen God or haven't heard the word, that is your concern. You cry for them. You spend night and day praying for them. And even then, there was one time here in this text, in verse 31, it's not that I want to go there, but I just want to say you that even with the leaders and the congregation is concerned. He said in verse 31, therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I, I cease not to warn you every night and day with tears. He was here talking about the elders already, already in the congregation. Yet he was still worried about them that, hey, you gotta watch out yourself. You know that it will happen. Because at the end of this Bible episode was still fighting apostasy, false doctrine. But how did he fall? Before God about their first love. As simple as that. And that's how sometimes we miss. We are so animal in, in doctrine and things, but then we forget who we are. We become careless. Well, I've been a Christian for 40 years. But we become mechanical. No more first love. Another thing that we can see in these verses is he was faithful. And he was courageous. Look with me in 20. He said, And how I give back nothing, what probably got out to you, but showed you, and have both you publicly from house to house. I like our style of going house to house and Bible study and, and prayer meeting. We enjoyed our prayer meeting last Friday, that was it, right? In Dr. Lang's house. And yeah, that's what we should do. Because when, do we, when we do that, we are showing, yeah, the love for the household, the, the neighbors or or uh, the other people will witness that and know, oh, these guys are Christians. <coughs> he did not back down on that. He said, even though he was being chased, I give back nothing that was profitable. Of course, all doctrines and the Bible scriptures they are all profitable doctrine issues, the way man is supposed to be. They are. And he did not back down on that. He testified to everybody, not just to selected people. You know, honestly, sometimes we have the problem with other people. You know, I, uh, you know, I, I was living in LA, and uh, I know probably, honestly, I can say I was wrong. I was not comfortable going to the area where homeless was all over the place, but we have to serve meals on the mission. And it was hard for me to bring up my two sons and get there and serve. I was scared. But I did not come down. Hopefully, later, you know, as the years go by, I, uh, 
I realized that's how I taught my son, my two sons. I said we were serving on the line where homeless people comes in, and I said, so you guys better go to school, otherwise you're gonna end up in one of these lines. And praise God, they learn a lesson. And that's how a leader or a servant going to be. <coughs> Next one, in verse 22 to 27, we will also see how advantage it is to have a leader that is filled with the Holy Ghost and sincere. <coughs> you know, I think I, I would probably have backed down if I was being, uh, you know, compelled by the Spirit. Hey, don't go there, you're going to be persecuted. Well, why would I do, right? But Paul, he went, he went. Look with me in verse 22. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit into Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. Look at that. He knows that something will happen to him when we get when he get to Jerusalem. But he was being compelled by the Holy Spirit. He said, go ahead, Paul. I am with you. And that was enough for Paul. Paul could have said, oh no, uh, I, I might as well stay here in Antioch. People love me in Antioch. Why go to Jerusalem? I'm going to be uh, put in chain. You know, Actually, uh, 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 that will happen in the next chapter. There was this young man uh, in verse 9, and in the same man, he, uh, this man Adam, he said that, and we tarried there many days. Then come down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come to us, he took Paul's girdle, the belt. He said, bowed his own hands and feet, and said, Thus saith the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews in Jerusalem buy the man that owned this girdle. Tell you what, it did happen. With that revelation, I probably would strike down. Uh, excuse me, I don't want to kill myself. I probably would have said many excuses not to go there. But here is the beauty of God. Verse 24. Look at with me in verse 24. But none of these things move me Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the, of the grace of God. Priority in his life was to share the gospel. Can we honestly, can we honestly say that to ourselves? Again, self-assessment. And Paul was that. His main purpose in life was to preach the word, to finish the race.
I may, I may probably say that that's too much. Because I can assure you, there are some times in which I don't have that desire. I, 24 hours a day, sometimes I don't have that, you know, not urge to still really go out there, especially in five followers. It's to me, it's too far now. But Paul, he has to do it. Because he wants to finish the race with joy. I think at one time I said, it's easy to start something. The really hard is to finish well. It's less, just like marriage, you know. It's easy to get married. Yeah, you're married. Are you ready for the long haul of a hardship marriage? That's the same thing with the ministry. Again, self-assessment. Examine yourself. Am I ready to go on with this? With the forum. And let me remind you, uh, young Jeffrey, the calling is not just for you. The calling is also concerns the wife. Because without the wife, the ministry is not going to flourish. Flourish. <laughs> you are just a teamwork. Thanks for the encouragement that you used to send me while I was. I was working hard in California. I was telling you. <coughs> And yeah, that's the reality of the ministry. But again, look with me in 25 and 26, 27. I know that the all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. There was a change of talk. All of a sudden, this people was not aware of that until this time. They did not think that they would not see Paul anymore, but yes, there is. It's a reality now. That to those he have shared the gospel in Ephesians, the elders, the elders whom he have trained, he may not be around no more to see them. But he said, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. He has shared the gospel to them. So he is content. He is innocent of the blood of men. Actually, before that, he said in, in chapter 18, verse 6, the Jews in the synagogue was driving him crazy. He were, they were blaspheming the word. And Paul said, enough is enough. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he showed his surrender and said unto them, 
your blood be upon your own head, not mine. Your own. And from him, he said, I will go into Gentiles. That was Paul's trial. But he was sincere to tell them, yeah, I did not shun to share you the whole counsel of God. I did not just explain to you the love of God. I have told you also, told you the consequences of not following the Lord. So he can say, he can say in verse 27, he did not shun to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I'm glad this church. I'm glad it is a blessing. Not just hear the love of God, but also the consequences of not believing the Lord Jesus Christ. The whole counsel of God should be preached from the pulpit. Whole, not just one side. The whole counsel of God. And now, he changed his tone. He is now going to tell them about shepherding, about hard working. How hard is it, he said, to be a hard working shepherd to his flocks? You know, I like to use the word shepherd because actually the real shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all like sheep lost somewhere and Christ has gathered us into his one fold, his flocks. Look what he said. In 28, he said, Am I a, Is my, my time okay, Pastor? Yeah. Okay, 28, he said, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. Here you go. Again. You know why I've been saying, take him among yourselves? Because you know, for you to be a leader, for you to be a believer, you have to check yourself out where you are at right now. If there is still doubt, you better take care of that doubt. Because pretty soon, that's going to be a weekly part of your ministry. You're going to have doubts. And when he said that, take heed to all the flock. Shepherd the flock. In the Old Testament, the shepherd will, will, will pour up some wool, some beer, some irons. And that's the job of the shepherd. Not just bringing them into a great pasture and set them in, in a, a, a river besides them so they can drink. You have to guard them against the wolves. And that's what he was worried. For I know, he said, that after my departing, 
shall bring his wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flocks. You know, that will happen eventually. And I tell you, churches are not actually uh, given problems from the outside. We know how we stand. You know, us and the outside. The problem that we have to watch out is within ourselves. If we are not sure about ourselves, then there is going to be a breakdown. He said, also of your own self shall man arise, speaking perverse things, draw away disciples after them. Therefore, I just want to remind you, he said, I did not spend three years among you. spent three years for nothing. I cried for you. I prayed for you. <coughs> but there is a good part in this. 32, he said, and now, brethren, I commend you to God. What a commendation. That is the right commendation. I commend you to the word of God. can be commended to read some books, to go to seminars, or probably uh, some spiritual leader, speaker somewhere. But the best is, go back to basics. Go back to the Word. If Paul can say, I have spent three years with you reading the books, Is it not only also proper for us to go back? Read the Bible all the time. Fellowship with one another makes us strong. And then he said, into the last, he said, I have committed no man to savor or gold in a party. Oh, don't, don't, get, don't get me wrong in this. I have always recommended that uh, the leaders or the elders are not to be paid. No, he's not saying that. He's just explaining that Paul was not lazy. Even when he was preaching the word, he was working. You know, when a leader or an elder or a pastor have become so much concerned about how much is this going to get paid, something wrong with the calling or that certain elder, I'm telling you, something is wrong. The money helps. But it's not the main focus. If your money, if money is your motivation in the ministry, I tell you, 
again, I will say to you, you are in a wrong profession. You are in a wrong field. Don't go to the ministry. There's no body there. And Paul is saying, yeah, you have to give honor, double honor to the one that serves the church. You can do that. But he's not saying that, hey, don't pay the pastor. No, he's not. And then he said that, yeah, you yourselves know that I, that these hands have ministered into my necessities and to them that were with me. Paul is just saying, yes, I work for my way that you, I can have this and live this lifestyle. I'm not doing this in luxury. You not seeing those that are telling evangelists somewhere and they were driving in a limousine and you can see all you know the jewelry in the hands. It's not a priority of your ministry. I have showed you all things. How that so laboring you owe to support the weak. And that's one reason why he was going to Jerusalem. He was bringing some gifts that were collected on that last journey of his. This is his third missionary journey. And he wants to go rush to Jerusalem because they needed help. There was certain money with him to be distributed in Jerusalem to help the weak. This is interesting, he said. How the Lord said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. You know, I look for this in the whole gospel, in the full gospel, I couldn't find it. Yeah, I, I guess you wouldn't find it either. But you know, in the last chapter of John, John 20, I think, John said that the Lord Jesus Christ has done so many miracles, said so many things, that is not written in the Bible. So this must be one of them. Because, so in my Bible, it says, it's read, you know, uh, how the Lord Jesus Christ tell it to himself. He said that it is more blessed to give than to receive. It was coming from the Lord. And it's true. And we want to come to this end with a happy face. You know? From 36 to 38, we will see a compassionate pastor or a compassionate leader. Why did I say a compassionate? Not that he knelt down and prayed. That's not the only reason. But he understand what was going on. He can see to the faces of these elders that he was going to miss, miss him. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them. We need a prayerful leader. We need them. Because I'm telling you, sometimes, I, you know, I, uh, I don't always remember to pray. 
I have been praying for my daughter-in-law, Anat. I mean, a lot. I have been praying that I be able to admit that I will be changed. How I know things. And sometimes it's hard. It is hard. The next two verses said that they all wept and fell on Paul's neck. Oh, you know? What a drama. So it was of all for the words, the words that he spake. What was that? That they would not see his face no more. That was a farewell speech, a farewell message, a farewell to God. And they accompanied him into the ship. They even accompanied the guy <coughs> into the ship. Well, the tour of speaking about leadership is over. But you know, you know the conclusion is this. I want to say this. Out in my home, in my own heart, experience with me. You know when you get to be like 73 years old, you have a little experience in your life as probably a believer, a pastor, whatever, you know. This is what I have gotten. The church is supposed to be a family for the good and bad. Because, hey, we cannot be like goody goody here and body body here, but hey, we're all in one. The disagreements and times that we lift each other up and support one another. But there is one basic thing that we have to remember we will lose the love for each other. Amen. And we are supposed to show it. What's with the love if you, you know, you can say, I love you, man. You know, you gotta show it. And God bless you all. I love you, by the way. God bless you all. Let's bow our head and let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for the wisdom that you have given us. The words of Paul, we pray that it will stick in, your, in our mind, especially in verse 24. That it is our desire, O God, in our life, in this life, that we will be able to finish this course we join, the race that you have given to us, that you have assigned to us, that we will serve you well and faithfully, not just, O oh God, to be a faithful servant, but also a filled spirit and sincere, a hard-working shepherd to his flocks. And finally, O oh God, we pray for us, for us all, not just the leaders, to be compassionate to one another. Thus we pray in Christ's name. Amen, amen, amen.